The views, opinions, and advice expressed in this podcast are solely those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and positions of Patterson Media or the sponsors of this program. Wellness is. We sometimes become so disconnected with how food affects every aspect of our body. And every day it's creating all of us and it's helping heal. I'm sort of an everything Italian. <laughs> I eat everything, but I just do it responsibly and I don't over consume any one thing. The list is your friend. It's a tool to help our life get better. The list is supposed to make your life easier. It's supposed to make you feel good. So use it to your benefit. If we understand that every trial that comes to us in life is there to help us grow, then we can welcome that and keep asking ourselves, what is it that I need to learn from this experience? Welcome to Choosing Wellness, your podcast for practical advice about how to attain better physical and mental well-being so that instead of just surviving, you're thriving. Choosing Wellness is powered by Pattison Media. In this series, we'll share a health journey, explore the trends, and talk to the experts who'll help you live your best life. And we'll have fun doing it. In this episode, we talk about eating for longevity and the blue zones. Chef Ned discusses vegan versus omnivore. Life Unlimited Stephanie Staples tackles lists. And in our mindfulness moment, how we help ourselves potentially live longer. Happy birthday to you. I'm Linda Freeman. Come join the journey of choosing wellness. How to choose wellness. We're talking about eating for longevity, which is something we may not think about, but we're so connected to what we put into our bodies. Kim Riziki is an integrative nutrition and health coach. It's so great to have you on Choosing Wellness. You know how important it is, how food makes us feel, and actually what that means to our bodies and to our overall health and our longevity. Welcome. Yeah, thanks so much, Linda. I'm excited to be here. I think We sometimes become so disconnected with how food affects not only how we feel, but our longevity and every aspect of our body, right? It's the only thing we take from the outside world and put inside our body. And every day it's creating all of us. It's creating our blood and our hair and our eyes and it's helping heal. And it's this information pathway that I don't think we always connect to. I don't think we do. And I think we don't often connect what we put into our bodies and what that means for us. And I really think that this is something that should be at the forefront of conversations because we need to shift from this highly processed society back to eating how we were supposed to eat. And that's really healthy food that is good for us. Our bodies are not made to digest, like you mentioned, a lot of the highly processed, highly packaged foods. And it often takes a lot of our energy to digest these foods and to work them through our body. And so that's often why you feel that drain (sighs) if you eat a very highly processed meal or if you eat a deep fried or very salty snack, your body is really dealing with that and trying to balance itself out. And so it's draining all of your energy to digest this food when in turn it should be the opposite you should be eating this food to give you energy to make you feel better so there's definitely a connection there between how you feel your energy levels and what you're eating i think it's just hard for us to accept that we do need to eat more vegetables we do need to have more fruits in our lives we need to eat those healthy foods i would love for you to speak to the importance of the food that we put into our bodies and how that can truly help us heal I actually can speak firsthand to this. I feel that I healed my body and my ailments with the way I ate. And I can tell you this probably started around 14, 15 years ago. I was struggling with a lot of health issues. I had extremely low energy, a lot of digestive distress, struggling to get through the day, cystic acne all over my face, brain fog. Every day seemed like such a struggle. So I felt like I was eating fairly healthy, but it turned out that I wasn't. I was consuming a lot of inflammatory foods and things that were not contributing to my healing. Eating more plant-based has been shown to increase longevity. And when we say longevity, it's not like, oh, I'm going to live to be 110. It's more about your health span. 
and how many years you're going to be healthy in that longevity. I mean, if you're going to live to 100, but the last 25 years you're very unwell, that's not real longevity in my eyes. And so we want to think about health span. What's going to keep us feeling free of disease, feeling good well into our later years? And that's when we start to bring in foods that keep our inflammation down. Inflammation is the root of almost every age-related disease. So if we can think about foods that do that. So, of course, fruits and veg right away. Fruits and veg, they all contain antioxidants. They're going to help lower inflammation. They contain such a wide variety of vitamins and nutrients that are going to support. They're going to help fight off some disease, support your heart, support your brain. Ideally, seven to ten servings a day. We want to think about five different colors of vegetables because different colors have different attributes. Get in all these different vital nutrients that will all help reduce your inflammation. So ideally, fruit and veg, we want that to really be the base of our diet for longevity. Yeah. And then we can start to add other things in. The beauty of plant-based proteins is number one, they contain no cholesterol. When we eat a plant-based protein like a bean or a lentil that's full of fiber, which is heart healthy and doesn't contain cholesterol. So starting to add in some more of those is a really great way to help protect your heart, your brain, and give you a little bit more longevity. I think a big maybe roadblock for people is they think of this as dieting. We need to shift that thinking from diets because diets fail. Research shows almost every diet fails. So we need to shift this to thinking about sustaining a healthy diet and lifestyle, not dieting. It is all about your lifestyle. It is actually all about your habits. And we pick up habits along the way. We pick up habits as children. We all eat birthday cake on birthdays, right? Yay! It's not like we all had a salad for happy birthday. Here's your birthday salad. Yay! And breaking habits is so hard. This goes like kind of deep into that brain work. First time you rode a bike or the first time you started driving and backed out of your driveway, it was so hard. And now you can do it no problem. Yeah. So shifting from stopping at a fast food place to grab your breakfast in the morning to making a smoothie, people are like, oh, I can't do that. There's no time. I don't know how to just starting, grabbing a recipe, doing it. In two weeks, you're going to be like, yeah, this is what I do. So it's a mindset shift, but the more you start to do it, the better you will be at it. It takes seven days to break a habit or five days or whatever it happens to be. You have to give some commitment to it and really work towards it. And I always find I never eliminate absolutely everything. If there's some things that I really do enjoy, I'll have it occasionally, but it's occasionally. So 80% of the time or 90% of the time, I'm working to eat really healthy and put things into my body that do nourish, that helps with that. I really like that perspective, Kim. And I also like the plant-based incorporation here. And that ties well into what I'm going to be talking about next in this podcast and that's the blue zones and these refer to the geographic areas in which people have low rates of chronic disease and live longer than anywhere else and one of those linkages that they see is that more of a plant-based diet. I have done quite a bit of research into blue zones and I will say a lot of it is their nutrition but your health is a whole circle right and nutrition is one component and sometimes we get very very caught up in like food and exercise and that's it but there's so much more there's connection and there's purpose and there's your relationships your spirituality all these things connect to your health and so I think that's what they're doing really good in the blue zones is not only focusing on movement and nutrition but all these other key aspects from a nutrition standpoint I think so much of it is that they are reducing the sugary foods the packaged foods the stress inducing foods you know things that are made really quick and they've just gone back to slow food real food and focusing on their health. And I think that for all of us, just going back to sort of the basics, instead of making it so complicated, it is really helpful. I know Blue Zones, I believe, has the nine principles. Mm -hmm. I like to break it down from the nutrition standpoint as sort of like four to avoid, four to add in. So your four to avoid are like your sugary drinks. They're not drinking sugary drinks and Blue Zones, you know, pops and things like that. Your packaged foods like candy, avoiding deep fried foods, and then processed meats things like bacon and cold cuts, they're actually a number one carcinogen, huge cancer causing. So those are really like your four to avoid, four to always have, fruit and veg, five to 10 servings, nuts and seeds, a handful of day, always choosing raw nuts, walnuts, almonds. Walnuts have the most antioxidants of any nut. If you look at them, they look like your brain. Just that little connection. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's so cool. Like it really is. Yeah. You think about a tomato, it looks like your heart, right? And like a penis, so good for your heart. 
or dark leafy greens. They look like your veins and they're such a good boost for your circulation. There's, there's a lot of connections there. Your beans and legumes, a cup of cooked beans or legumes a day. Canned beans are okay. You know, your nice low and slow whole grains like oats or quinoa or buckwheat, things are going to keep you, your energy going well. So those are sort of your four and four that I like to start off with when we're going into longevity or blue zones. These are really great pieces and supports that you can give to people. Anything else that you want to add before we wrap up? Yeah, I like to speak just a little bit more to what you said about not eliminating anything. I love that your concept, you know, of 80, 20, 80% of the time you're doing all the good things. And 20% of the time you're enjoying things that you do love because that is also part of health. You've got to have a little bit of balance. I like to focus more on what you're adding in than what you're not consuming. And that gives you more of that vibrant, full, beautiful feelings. Yeah, Kim, thank you so much for your perspective thinking, you know, about what we put into our bodies and linking that to our health. It is so valuable. That connection, I believe, is vital to human health, longevity, and just living out a really good life. Now, you can find Kim at krplantbase.com and on Instagram at Kim Rizicki. Thanks, Linda. Health Tag. The conversation around plant-based diets versus omnivore diets has been a hot topic lately with the release of a documentary in January of 2024. The new Netflix documentary, You Are What You Eat, a twin experiment looks at sets of twins put on different diets for eight weeks to see how each diet impacts their overall health. One follows a vegan diet, the other an omnivore diet. The series is based on research led by Stanford Medicine. 22 sets of genetically identical twins were on opposing but healthy diets. Now, since the release, there's been much discussion around vegan versus omni. So Choosing Wellness producer Karen Habashi decided to get a unique food perspective and reached out to Chef Ned Bell, a well-known Canadian culinary talent who has forged a path as a chef, sustainable seafood advocate, keynote speaker, and educator. He just loves to make delicious food. So in recent years, there has been a rise in plant-based diets. Lots of people are following them and using them without really understanding the difference between plant-based and carnivore diets. Can you walk us through some of the myths surrounding them and what people think plant-based diets are? I'm not an expert in the comparison between plant-based and carnivore. You know, as a chef, my first goal is to cook delicious things that are good for us and good for the environments that we find ourselves in and or the community. Back in 2010, 2011, I put a plant forward menu on my restaurant menu as an everyday choice for our guests. And really the thought process behind that was if we build plant-based nutrient dense recipes and then we garnish with sustainable proteins, whether they be seafood proteins, plant-based proteins, carnivore proteins, etc., you're giving the consumer the choice. It's basically the same recipe, it just has the addition of animal protein. And what we found was that lots of people appreciated the simplicity of that. So it wasn't like we were labeling it vegan or vegetarian. We were proud of calling it plant-based, plant-forward. But most importantly, it was just delicious. And so I think now the consumer is much more aware of the opportunities to eat plant-forward foods. So for our listeners, can you elaborate more about sustainable protein and what do you mean with that? So I wear a number of hats. I'm the chef ambassador for this program called BBC here in British Columbia. And so we celebrate all fishers, farmers, artisans, makers, growers, processors in British Columbia. So the health of the stock of seafood, the specific choice of seafood, where it was fished, how it was fished, who fished it, was that fisher taking care of the resource and the ecosystem at the same time. And so the same could be said for ranchers, could be said for poultry farmers, could be said for dairy farmers. We are what we eat, and it's the same with animals. They are what they eat. So if they eat good ingredients, and they have a good life, it's my belief that the animal is going to 
be of higher quality and so potentially taste better. Can most of the consumers tell the difference? I really don't think so. The difference between conventionally raised protein and organically raised protein, it really depends on what the animal is eating and where it's raised. Yeah. And being an Egyptian, our diet is very balanced. We mainly eat vegetables, legumes, and beans more than anything. And I feel like it's culturally very different than North American diet. You bring up some really good points there about different cultural diversity and how a lot of cultures around the world already eat plant-based diets and smaller portions of meat. Some don't eat meat at all. In North America, we eat center of the plate, meaning we want a big chunk of protein in the middle of the plate. We're addicted to cheap in North America, but we're also creatures of habit when it comes to what we eat. Now, with all this incredible diversity that exists in North America from countries that have moved here from around the world for the last four, five, six generations, we have incredible diversity in our offerings. When I first started cooking plant-based in you know, late 2005 to 2010, like it was really about lentils and chickpeas and pulses and legumes. And then I really started to recognize there's way more you can do with vegetables than you can do with animal protein. So whether someone follows a plant-based or carnivore diet or a mix of both, what are some of the mistakes they usually do when committing to one type of diet over the other? For me, I don't know that I need to be 100% one way or the other. I absolutely eat more plant-forward dishes and recipes and ingredients than I do otherwise, but I eat everything, and I proudly eat everything. When you put yourself in a box, it just sort of restricts you. And this is my opinion. Lots of people are proud to be vegetarian exclusively, and lots of people are proud to be carnivores exclusively. I mean, I'm sort of an everything etarian. <laughs> I eat everything, but I just do it responsibly and I don't overconsume any one thing. And that includes sugar, carbohydrates, and that includes tons of animal protein. But the truth is, if you're a carnivore, you're eating lots of vegetables and plants anyway. And if you're a vegetarian, you're looking for protein from other sources. And so you just need to open your eyes to trying a few more plant-based recipes, maybe finding three to five recipes that your family really likes, and then just cooking them regularly. There's seven days in a week that we need to eat dinner and lunch, so why not eat vegetarian for breakfast, vegetarian for lunch, and have some animal protein at dinner? Or flip that if you want. Yeah, I don't like restricting myself, and I don't like the battles between the two carnivore vegetarian sort of conversation i just don't think it's it's healthy it should be moderation as everyone says that's very true what you eat is what you become and who you are and it's medicine and culturally speaking from my own culture in egypt food brings us together whether it's a, a sad or happy occasion food is the main theme you said food is medicine you're right Real food heals. It heals the mind, it heals the soul, it heals the body in times of tears or celebration. And I just don't know that there's a more important conversation than food. I really don't. It's the one way that you and I could become friends, right? Is we would share a meal together. And the one way that your children and my children could become friends would be maybe around sport or music or food. Maybe education, but for the most part, it's probably one of those things. And more than likely, it's going to be around food. Where you and I come to a dinner and you bring some Egyptian food and I bring some sustainable seafood and we sort of break bread together. Like all of a sudden we're talking about our kids and we're talking about our struggles and our spouses and our political challenges and or whatever it might be. Yeah, I agree. Well, I promise you I'm going to cook you a true Egyptian meal the next time you're in Vancouver. I will say yes. Thank you so much, Ned. Life Unlocked. How long we want to be on this earth, we have a lot of say in that matter. So we started at the end and then went back from there. When you found these blue zones, were there some themes running through all of them? Yes. 
If you want to know what a 100-year-old ate to live to be 100, you have to know what she was eating as a child and middle age and newly retired. So to get at that, we found 155 dietary surveys done in all five blue zones over the last 80 years, and we averaged them with the help of Harvard. And we found that 90 to 95%, they're eating a whole food plant-based diet meat only about five times per month and contrary to a lot of sort of keto slash paleo diet advice it's mostly carbohydrates complex carbohydrates which i think shocks a lot of people how would you feel if there was a cheat sheet that could help you live a healthier and potentially longer life would you use it for Life Unlocked, we explore areas of the world where people live longer. In the Netflix series, Live to 100, Secrets of the Blue Zones, best-selling author Dan Buettner traveled to places where people live much longer than average. And over a decade of compiling information, he summarized the how and why. Now, Dan is a National Geographic explorer, and he and his team began studying regions where people live the longest, and the term blue zones was coined. Now let's break down this idea. The Blue Zones areas are where people live the most extended lives, consistently reaching age 100. Now, to put that into perspective, the average lifespan in North America is around 77 years. Now, that's according to the Center for Disease Control. A key factor identified was that Blue Zones are more than just people living longer. They live healthier lives. According to the research, you can find the world's longest-lived man in Sardinia, Italy, where they live in mountainous regions, often work on farms, and drink red wine. In Okinawa, Japan, where they eat soya-based foods and practice Tai Chi, we find the world's longest-lived woman. In Akaria, Greece, there are significantly reduced rates of common chronic illnesses as people eat a Mediterranean diet rich in olive oil and vegetables. Nicoya, Costa Rica, people are more than twice as likely as Americans to reach 90 years of age by eating a diet based around beans and corn tortillas while living purposefully. And finally, the very religious Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, California, USA, who are strict vegetarians that are community-focused, live a decade longer than the average American. Through studying these areas, commonalities were discovered that explain longer lives without chronic disease than anywhere else. The big revelation, and you never hear about it because it's not sexy and marketers can't sell you things, but... An extra 10 years of life expectancy is the sum of lots of small improvements we make in our lives, mostly in our environment, applied for decades. As Kim Riziki mentioned earlier, Butner and his team documented nine healthy principles called the Power Nine and are the core of Blue Zone living. So go back to your cheat sheet and write these down. Making movement a natural part of your day. Knowing your sense of purpose, prioritizing stress relief, eating until you're about 80% full, eating a primarily plant-based diet, drinking alcohol in moderation, connecting with your community, putting family, whether biological or chosen, first, and choosing social circles that support healthy behaviors. While genetics somewhat determine your lifespan, about 20 to 30%, following certain life principles can help to increase your health span. Try slowly incorporating these nine principles and see what's realistic for you. Being Real Adjua Minta founded For All Ice Cream, a small batch ice cream manufacturer in Ontario, Canada. She's a chemical engineer turned food entrepreneur. Adjua dreamed of making handcrafted ice cream using all natural, locally sourced ingredients for those who want to indulge in a sweet treat without compromising their well-being. Her obsession with handcrafted ice cream began during a heat wave in August 2003 when she bought an ice cream machine instead of an air conditioner. This is Adjua's story. This is Being Real. I didn't necessarily choose ice cream first. What I chose first was entrepreneurship. I was experiencing an issue in my professional life where there was just limits. So I made a choice to move into entrepreneurship 
because what I was looking for was an opportunity to not have limits. I wanted to be able to work as hard as I wanted, move as far as I could without any boundaries or being boundless. Why ice cream is a question I get often. And I would say, why not ice cream? Ice cream is delicious. I love it. I'm a chemical engineer and what I actually studied to do was how to make things, how to design processes, how to take things from unfinished to finished. And my background is actually in food processing. So for me, it made sense to pursue ice cream, something I love, using my education, which I'm very proud of the fact that I'm an engineer and I didn't want to give up being an engineer. I feel like I'm flexing my engineering muscles, but in a very, very creative, very fun way. I've got West African parents and so the idea of Had I, you know, finished high school and said I wanted to get into making food, that would have been a big no. So I did what I was supposed to do and I became an engineer. While I was still working, I was starting to plan how I was going to basically execute this vision that I had. I also needed to learn how to make ice cream because I didn't really know how to do that beyond stuff in my home kitchen. And I was lucky enough to find... I'm gonna call him my ice cream professor because literally I went to ice cream university at the University of Guelph. It's a short course and the literal ice cream textbook in North America was written by one of the professors there again in my backyard. So to get myself started, I had squirreled away some money. I had found a place to lease only to find out that there are a lot of regulations around ice cream. Not everybody can make ice cream. If you're going to make ice cream, you have to be a licensed dairy plant. So that seemed like such a huge obstacle. I then was faced with the challenges of having to actually build out a production facility. I had signed a lease to like literally the tiniest unit ever. It was 500 square feet. But relying on actually my engineering background as a chemical engineer, but also my husband's engineering background, he's a mechanical engineer, we're able to piece through like the technical requirements of how to build a dairy plant. For a while, we were Ontario's smallest dairy plant. I hired one other person, so it was me and one person. And then we had four wholesale accounts my first year. And then we would sell ice cream out of the back of the factory to any people from the community that wanted to come take a look at what our facility looked like and try ice cream right from us directly. We are a better for you ice cream. There was absolutely a transition point in this journey and the idea of funding, the idea of getting support, like those are all critical things. So those are all things that I had to build and those are all things that I had to seek out. Seeking out community is part of what led me to apply for the Stacy's Rise grant program. I think it's pretty unique that there's a grant that's specifically for women. There is a financial component that the founders in that program receive. We get a 25K grant. But the piece that excited me so much about that was the mentorship of the PepsiCo executives. So specifically for women entrepreneurs and just the idea of being surrounded by women, it makes it a very powerful program. I feel like this sounds facetious, but I really mean it, where we're going to take over the world. Like Ontario first, that's our focus. We'd love to continue our growth across Canada by getting our delicious, delicious ice creams across the country. You can just go out to your store and pick it off the shelf. That's our push and that's our goal. And with the U.S. being such a big nearby market, we'd love to expand our line there. But, you know, step by step, bit by bit, I kind of want to take this as far as I can. Adjwa, as a chemical engineer and ice cream entrepreneur, I'm sure you'll do it. Thank you for sharing your story on finding your passion, following your dream, and developing a better-for-you ice cream. You can find her at forall.ca. That's F-O-U-R all dot C-A. Life Unlimited with Stephanie Staples. Well, we're back once again connecting with Stephanie Staples and your Life Unlimited. Now, Stephanie was a nurse and she changed her life and she found her calling as a motivational speaker. And it's her mission to help people who help people so that they can help people and themselves. And it's always great to see you. Thank you. We always have a good chat, don't we? We do. (laughs) And it's just endless. Like the lists are endless and the reason I said that is because we're going to talk about lists lists can actually help decrease stress and anxiety 
which I think is amazing. Research actually shows that having a plan decreases your anxiety and the results in feeling less overwhelmed, feel like you have more control in your life. And so it's kind of a really neat idea. And what I like is that there's more than just one kind of a to-do list, right? Oftentimes lists can be so awesome, so wonderful, so positive, so proactive. But there are people that are like, they see a list, they hear the word list. <laughs> And they just freak out and they don't like that either. So, you know, maybe we could think about the name for a list in a different language and maybe there's another way to say it. I don't know. <laughs> I think it's all in how you look at it and that's what you've broken down. And I really like this. And you can find something that works for you that actually does lift you up and makes you feel better and that it that it's achievable. So let's kind of walk through sort of your idea of lists. Give us some examples of some lists. One that I love is the to-be list. Like, who do I want to be this time next year? Imagine asking yourself that question. Who do I want to be this time next year? And probably more importantly is what do I have to do to grow into that? So one of the things for me this year, like I want to be a swimmer. I want to be able to swim like an adult with my head underwater. So in order to be a swimmer next year, I need to take swimming lessons. I need to go to the pool once a week. I need to make a commitment that change my mindset about, oh, I can't do that. For what might be on your to-be list for you, Linda? I actually did find something to put on my to-be list, and that was to reconnect with my yoga mentor. I teach yoga on top of the other things that I do, and I was kind of stuck, right? Because I teach the same way and do the same. And I'm like, I wonder if my teacher is still doing some private. Because I know that she still teaches. She's 75 years old, by the way. And she's incredible. Oh, wow. More yeah. character. She is so strong. And so I feel incredible because of it. Just that one thing that I decided to do because I wanted to be a better teacher. And it's working already, right? Oh, it was instant. Like my very first session with her changed. It just was a complete shift. And I didn't realize that I could do this to be list. This makes a difference. So a couple of things about that is you had that awareness of what I want to do, what I what needs to change and how that needs to happen. And you invested in yourself. You invested your time, your energy, your money. That's a big thing, right? And to do that, you have to be like, I am worth that. I am worth investing my time, my energy. You have to be forward thinking to say, after I do this, I'm going to come out different than when I went in. So it's an investment. So it's all a great mindset. Congratulations. That's great. Yeah, I like that too, to say that it's an investment in yourself to find, you know, what you want for that time next year. And you know what? You are and you will be. And you also it just inspired me too with what you said. You just gave me a new idea. What if you wrote like an inspiration list? Like people that inspire you, right? Like your, your teacher does. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you were feeling kind of yucky or bad or you want to be more inspiring, you could reflect on these people that have been like, who made a positive difference in your life and who, you know, you aspire to be like in some way, shape or form. That would be cool. An inspiration list. I like it. It would. And then it ties into the gratitude list, right? And I think that that's such a strong one too. Like it, the to-do list doesn't have to be a list of tasks that you've got to get done in a day. No. This is what I'm loving about this. As I looked through the incredible list of lists that you have, these are so great because they can help us. They can teach us. They can make us better people because of taking a look at our lives through a different lens. So what are some of the other ones that you've come up with? Well, here's something that I think it's a great idea, personally. It's the Tada list. So this is a list of big or small wins that you wouldn't mind getting some recognition for, you know, like I held my cool in that situation where I really didn't want to hold my cool. Or I went in the bathroom today. I didn't really want to do that, but I did that. I went for my hike. I said I was going to go for a hike today, and I went from I said those three emails. Ta-da! <laughs> Love the ta-da list. Just the name is great. Makes me laugh. Ta-da! Right? And it, there's hundreds of little tiny wins throughout the week that we're like, we did it. Like, we made another dinner for our family. Mm -hmm. Again. We braved the grocery store. Whatever we did. We did it. And then the other one that I found really interesting on your website, you've got all these great blogs and you talked about a psychology professor, I think it was in California, that found you're more likely to achieve your goals if you write them down. Yeah, like if you don't, again, if you don't like the name bucket list, I like the name adventure list or a life list. 
I prefer to be kind of like, this, this is what I want to do this year. This year, these are reasonable things. These ones can wait, but, but which things are more of a priority to me? And my friend calls it a uh, YIDE, Year Inspiring Defining Event. So every year he has one thing that makes that year stand out. So maybe it's a one-on-one -on -one trip with one of his kids to somewhere or, you know, an event of some sort that makes, oh yeah, 2024, that was the year I did the Kusum climb. You know, that is, that is my thing for this year. Yeah, what a great way to be able to reflect back on years as well, right? To look at what you were able to achieve. Because then every year you can go back and look and say, oh, this is the year I did this and this is the year I did that. And life can get mundane. It can get routine. It can get boring. We just, we work, we shop, we cook, we sleep. If we want to live our life unlimited, like, let's go. Like, what are we waiting for? It's time to take small steps. And even when we start, so say maybe we're, I'm training for this climb, like even just the climb is one thing, but all the training for it and, and going hiking with my friends and, and all that stuff that leads up to it, that's all filling me up too, right? It's all making me a better person. It's all connecting with other people. It's being in the fresh air. All those things that the climb, yeah, that's awesome. If I can do that at the end, super duper. But all the things that are leading up to that are still huge wins. There is something to be said about the list of lists. And, you know, research does show that they can really help provide that clarity in our lives. So some takeaways for people, breaking it down, even if you're a little nervous about lists, Steph, what can you tell listeners? The list is your friend. It's a tool to help our life get better. And we need to be the boss of it and we need to control it. The list is supposed to make your life easier. It's supposed to help you feel accomplished. It's supposed to give you ideas for the future. It's supposed to make you feel good. So use it to your benefit. Use it in a way that serves you. It doesn't have to be the way anybody else does it, but use it in a way that will make you feel good and make your life easier. I love it. Harness the power of lists. Write things down. Anything else before we go, Steph? You know, can you just make a fun and relaxation list so that when you're like stressed and you don't know, like, oh, I don't even know what I need. I'm just cranky and miserable. Have a list there. Like, and just here's the 10 things that make me feel better. And then you don't even have to think about it. You just pick one or two of those things and you just do them. Making positive, proactive lists is one more way to live your life unlimited. Love it. Thanks. Mindfulness Moment. How can mindfulness and meditation help us stay present in our lives? And is there a connection to longevity? Claire Maisonneuve is a registered clinical counselor who for over 30 years has been using her skills to help individuals heal difficult emotions and find their way to create a life they love and become the person they admire. This is Mindfulness Moment. Living longer and healthier is really about not so much how do I extend my life, but how do I determine the quality of my life while I'm still alive? And I think that's where meditation and mindfulness really comes in. It can improve the quality of our existence, whether I live till I'm 40, 60, or 100. I don't know when that's going to happen, but I do know moment from moment what my experience of life can be if I make the right kind of effort. So mindfulness and meditation are ways of helping us connect to the peace and the joy and the calmness and the even-mindedness that is potential that exists in all of us. The other important factor in all of that is the importance of having good relationships as we age. How are my relationships with my children and my grandchildren? Because that, to me, is one of the key factors, actually, that determines how well we live our lives. And research shows that, too. You know, even people that go through illnesses, they will fare better. They will succeed at recovery better when they have love and supportive family around them. And so better health is really there because you have less stress inside of you. And better recovery is there because you have more harmonious relationship and more support around you, less conflict in your life and less worry. 
I don't know if this is going to give you a longer life, but it's going to determine how we live our lives present day and also how we're going to die. To me, death is a very important part of life. So how comfortable we are with the process of both aging and dying is something, again, that we can come to terms with the more we meditate, the more we spend time inside ourselves and make that connection to our inner life, our inner world inside of us. I would say that one of the greatest causes of anxiety in people's lives is their fear of aging and of dying. And we as a society have this incredible denial of aging and death. We don't want it. We don't like it. We have aversion towards it. And all of that actually creates a lot of anxiety in people. And so the more we connect with our heart and soul inside of us, the more we can live life from a place of confidence, of security, of safety and faith. We really need to have an anchor. And that anchor is not in the world outside of us. We need an anchor. And that anchor is within us. It's the peace and the calmness and the sense of security that we feel when we're able to go within and contact the soul and the spirit inside of us. And those hardships and challenges are really there to help us basically take the next step in our own personal, emotional, spiritual, and psychological evolution. If we understand that every trial that comes to us in life is there to help us grow, to help us move towards the next step in our evolution, then we can welcome that and keep asking ourselves, what is it that I need to learn from this experience? How do I need to grow? What soul qualities do I need to activate and develop in this situation in order to help me move in the direction towards a better life, a more peaceful life? Claire Maisonneuve is with Alpine Counseling Clinic. You can find her at anxietyandstressrelief.com. Life is challenging, and choosing wellness in our daily lives may seem like adding to the already long to-do list, but together we can make it easier. Join us on the next Choosing Wellness as we tackle more health ideas. I'm Linda Freeman. Let's connect again soon as together we take the journey of Choosing Wellness. You've been listening to Choosing Wellness, an initiative powered by Pattison Media designed to inspire and motivate a healthy life. For more information on this program, go to everythinglifestyle.ca. Another Everything Podcast production. Visit everythingpodcast.com, a division of Patterson Media. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast.